Good morning, Family Church. We are talking about an important topic, and we are talking about work. So I want you to think about the worst job you ever had. And maybe it was bad because it was a hard thing to do, or maybe it was bad because of the people you had to work with, or whatever the circumstances. What's the hardest job? And then I'll tell you mine. When I was 15 years old, uh, I needed some money, and I got an opportunity from a guy that was kind of a crusty old farmer in our church, and he said, I have a job for you. And so he took me to this job site, and it was a dilapidated old chicken coop that had about six inches of chicken manure in the bottom of it, and there had been a water line that had broken. So it was soupy, and it was so stinky. And so my job was to wheel a wheelbarrow in there and to take a big snow shovel and to scoop it out and put it into the wheelbarrow and then to carry it or to push it clear up the, the back ramp and to dump it out the backside. And I tell you, it was hard to breathe. I was gagging. It was hot in there. And when I got home, my mom was like, take your clothes off outside the door. We will wash those in a special load and you just stink. And you know, one thing about having your worst job when you were 15 is uh, everything is up from there. But I want you to think about this idea of work and that the Bible talks about how we are to be involved as, in the, the work that we do. And your work may be all kinds of different things. You may be somebody involved in the logging industry and you may be able to work outdoors and that's beautiful sometimes. Or you may be somebody who works in, inside and yet Work is a, is a critically important place for key relationships and how we get to know each other and how we respond. And, and last week we talked about parenting and work begins at home. The work ethic, the, the idea of how you work and why you work and what your attitude at work is, is, is framed and formed when you are a kid. And some of you may be working in offices and it may be something that you're taking care of people's money or investments or whatever, or you may be a cashier checking things out at the store and you have to, <laughs> you have to interface through a, a plastic shield at this point because this, this is how work is looking these days. Uh, because of the COVID-19 concerns, you may be working uh, behind a shield and with a mask or you may be trying to work at home with kids playing trampoline on the bed behind you. And uh, our work here at Family Church has been more like this. We're sitting in little boxes and little squares and... Uh, let me tell you, a meeting in Zoom time is about twice as long as any other meeting. And so work is hard. I said that a couple weeks ago. I said marriage is hard. And last week we said parenting is hard. And working with a good attitude, with the right heart for a long time in a tough place is hard. And I believe that the scripture always speaks to the things that are most important in life. And we're going to look at some verses that talk about as we're in this series on living. Because we've talked about who we are in Christ and how he has given his life for us. And we are loved and sealed and cared for. And now we are to carry that into the, the real nitty gritty of life. I think that's why he talks about roles. And then he talks about we're to be imitators of Jesus. And then he talks about this is how it gets down to where the tire meets the the road is in your marriages and in your parenting and how you respond to, to people at work. And so I'm going to read some verses. If you want to turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, we're continuing on with this idea of how does God want us to live? What, what is a Christ follower to look like in the, the daily life? And so we start with Ephesians 6 verse 5. And he starts with, slaves obey your earthly masters. Now, if you're used to the Bible and reading that, it's like, yeah, I just know he's talking about the situation that was in the time frame. But, but in our culture, we read that and we go, oh, that's ugly, slavery. And we're going to talk about slavery, and we're going to talk about why didn't God just rule it out at that point. And we're going to talk about how that impacts our world today. But suspend that thought for just a moment, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But right now, I want us to take and make the application of these verses to how do I behave in the workplace when I am the employee, when I am the one who is being supervised, and then he's going to turn in a moment and talk about masters. And, and so that 
would in our application be somebody who is, re, he is directing or managing or owning the, the one who is on the employer side of it? So having said that, let's go back and read those for ourselves. Again, don't think of what's, who else should be listening to this. Think about what God's trying to say to you. Slaves or employees, workers, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. So again, there he's pulling a really high bar and saying your spiritual relationship with Christ should affect how you are in the toughest of work situations. He says, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. So he brings this spiritual focus out of this workaday world, masters and slaves, employers, employees, and he says, I want you to get a, a, a third perspective here. What is God's view of this? And then he switches cases and he says, and masters. So he's talking here to masters who are followers of Jesus. And he says, treat your slaves in the same way. What does that mean? In the same way. We'll answer that in a moment. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Don't think you are such a big deal. God is the one who is over both of you. And so we come to this extremely important topic, and that is how is my work spiritual? I think we have a tendency to have a split personality when it comes to work. I, I, I think even sometimes as a church we have fed into it, that sometimes our messages and what we're talking about all sound like how you should respond and, and how you should act with other believers at church or in your home. And we don't speak very often into how does a follower of Jesus different in the marketplace? How are you doing the work that God has called you to in a way that is spiritual? And, and I think it means that we need to have a 24-7 spiritual life. That You cannot have this schizophrenia where you're one way in a church meeting, you're a different way in your home atmosphere, and then you are yet a different person at work. And, and I am deeply saddened when I hear people who are followers of Jesus and maybe even leaders in the church, and it comes back around that they swear at their workers, they're angry with them, they take, a, they take out their frustrations on them, they, they don't accept responsibility, they're blaming, and all of these activities, and sometimes it's even worse, they're cheating and lying and stealing and they're doing things that are absolutely wrong. And somehow it's okay because, and I hate this phrase, business is business. And somehow, because it's in a workplace, it's okay not to act like a follower of Jesus. And if you think your workplace is bad, then you think about what it must have been like for slaves and masters, for people who were literally their body and soul and, and, and their future was owned by their masters. And you realize that he's saying in those situations, your relationship to Jesus is so important. And I want to go back for a moment to that chicken coop story. You see, I was doing an awful job and the boss was kind of gruff and distant. He wasn't a big factor, but there was a reason I was doing that job. See, I had, I had seen in a magazine article that there was this huge Christian conference down in Dallas, Texas. And as a 15-year-old, it caught my imagination. And I asked my parents, can I go? And they said, well, if you begin to pray about it, and if God provides the money, you can go. It's like, whoa. Now that I've been a parent of 15-year-olds, I'm not sure. <laughs> they must have had a lot more trust in me than I deserved. But I began to start, you know, send out a letter, asked for support, started getting involved in that. And that's when this job to shovel out the chicken manure came up. And I felt like God said, are you serious about this? In other words, I'm going to provide for you. And some of my relatives sent checks and there was this wonderful sense of support. But there was also this question like, are you willing to work for what you want? And so as I was feeling gagged in that job, as I was taking my clothes off that probably should have been burned, what helped keep me going is there's a why behind the job. 
that there's a motive, that there's a different, there's something driving it. It was, it was a part of God at work in my life, a part of God answering prayer, a part of God allowing me to do something that became a huge impact on my young spiritual life. So I think that's what he's trying to, to drill down on here is not just how you work, but why you work. And when that motive gets changed, then it changes everything else. So we're talking about how we should be as followers of Jesus. And at the beginning of chapter four, he says, be imitators of Christ. And then he gives us some markers of what that looks like. And it's easy to think those are great words. He, he gives us the attitudes of humility. Whatever you do, be humble, be gentle, be patient. And then we've talked the last couple of weeks how God, God sees submission to the authorities in our life in respect to God as a beautiful thing and as a helpful and shaping thing. And so you look at those attitudes and you say, yeah, those are really spiritual. When I am in my life group, I should always have those. And the question I want us to ask is, are these the attitudes that characterize me at work? Whether you are working at home, whether you're a kid uh, just doing chores around the house, whether you are somebody who's making a lot of money, the question is, what is the attitude that comes out of you being a Christ follower in the workplace. And we talked about how those are wonderful qualities that we all agree on, but they are so difficult to live out in a daily life. And I think for most of us, it's probably the home and the work that are the more difficult places for those attitudes to be consistent. And I believe in my goal for you is that as you more you grow in Christ, you should be all you are everywhere you are. That there shouldn't be a schizophrenia of your different people with different hats on, but that you should be a follower of Jesus wherever you go. And so he talks about these attitudes and then he, and then he gives us an interesting little part of the why he says, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ. And that's kind of a jarring identity. When we talk about being adopted by God and, and, and there are all these pictures that are in the first part of the book of Ephesus or in the book of Ephesians and, and somehow being uh, adopted makes me feel warm and cared for and, and being sealed makes me feel secure. And, and every one of these word pictures has a very important function. And, and here we are coming back again to who am I and what does it mean to be a slave of Christ? And usually slavery has a very negative connotation, but, but really here it means that before we were, connected to Christ. We were slaves of sin. Romans said we were, we were caught. We couldn't do anything that pleased God. And that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, he came along to that marketplace where we were being auctioned off as slaves. And he bought us not with, not with cheap things like gold and silver and precious stones. First Peter says, but with the precious blood of Jesus, we have been bought. And so we are joyfully giving ourselves to serve God, to now be a part. And Romans says we're slaves of righteousness. We want, we want to be as enthusiastic in serving God as we were in serving ourselves. And because of that, one of the critical factors that we have talked about all through this series is that we are to respond to God instead of reacting to people. And when I get in trouble, it's usually because I get my eyes off how God wants me to, to do. And I get my focus on what other people are doing and how they're making me feel. And it changes everything when I say, okay, God, that the way I work, I want to work like you were right next to me. Like you were, I was serving you like, like we were in this together. And because of that, it's going to change my attitude. It's going to change what's going on inside of me. Now, let's speak to just a moment to that issue of slavery, because I think when you read through that, we understand that slavery is evil. And why didn't God just stomp it out? Why, why didn't he just say, get rid of slavery? And I think it's an interesting part as you watch the, the will of God unfold through the scriptures that in much the same way that God didn't demand that polygamy be stamped out in the old Testament and that God, that, that slavery was such an institution within the culture he was speaking of, that the point that he was giving to them was not to change the ills of society at that moment, but 
to help lead people to Jesus. And eventually those slaves that responded in a Christ-like way, God eventually used people who were Christ followers to stamp out slavery. And William Wilberforce in England was a huge believer who was a key part of outlawing the, the slave trade. And so I believe it's safe to say that God is against people owning each other and the abuses and the awful things that came with that. And in fact, in, in the Roman world, in the Bible times that we're talking about, um, slavery was not based on color or race. It was mostly about being conquered, that if you were a conquered people, that you were taken as slaves and or economic. It, it was their way of dealing with bankruptcy. And, and when people didn't have any other resources, they sold themselves as slaves. And sometimes that was permanent and sometimes that was limited. But having said all that, as soon as we hear the word slaves, it triggers something deep and in our culture, very emotional and very, at this point, very relevant and in all the news. So, so as your pastor, I want to just talk to you for a moment about this whole idea of racism and in the unfolding drama as uh, a man named George Lloyd was cruelly or George Floyd was, was cruelly murdered it has triggered again that the ugly part of in our culture, how people often see those who are of different color and different culture. And I think particularly the African-American culture has been felt oppressed since they were hauled here in change. And the history of their time here is based on slavery. And, and I want to just say a couple things that I think we can all agree on is what does it mean to be a Christ follower as we respond to all of these things that we see around us, all of this, and there's so much emotion. And, and, and if I could ask you for just a moment to, to listen carefully, let's, let's lower the, the level of feeling and let's talk about our hearts. Let's talk about what God wants. And, and I think it's, it's important to start with that racism is real. That in Douglas County, we don't have a highly diverse population and there are not a lot of people who look different or have different cultures, but there are some. And, um, and frankly, there's a lot of racism in Douglas County. I hear comments about it and, and sometimes it's against African Americans, but often it's against Hispanics or even people from India. And, and there's this feeling that the, that the white uh, majority here have a right to everything and that other people are crowding us and they should stay where they came from and those kinds of feelings. And, and can I, can I say that racism is wrong, that that should not be something that a follower of Christ treats somebody disrespectfully, treats them as less than treats them in, in any kind of an insensitive way, simply because they're of a different ethnicity or color or culture. In fact, I think if we're going to be biblical Christians, you realize that, that the whole foundation for the differences comes out of Genesis 11, that when the people who were supposed to spread out over the whole earth, when they instead said, we're going to form a tower, the tower of Babel, and we're going to be one people in one language, and we are going to make a name for ourselves. And God changed their languages. God intentionally made them disperse all over, which, which is created in the incredible Creativity, the human spirit has created all kinds of different cultures and music and language and, and in the random genetic drift has created different colorations and different, different facial features. And the, the beauty of that is somehow summed up in, in Revelation chapter seven, where it comes together and it paints a picture of God sitting on the throne and in front of him, there are people and it says people of every language, nation, tongue, country in the world, every ethnic group. And that there's this, that God doesn't want a monochromatic one color world. He wants this beauty of all these cultures and lifting up their songs and their dances and their costumes and, and their strengths and lifting them up to glorify the one. So if you're a follower of Jesus, I think one of the things that we need to say is that there should be a repentance in our own hearts. And, and an honest searching, because when I honestly look at my own life, I grew up in largely white areas, and I am of, of, a, of a class that has often been in the majority. And, 
And sometimes that led towards insensitivity and even just, I didn't like to go to places that were very diverse and where there are all kinds of different things. It just felt uncomfortable, maybe even unsafe. And as God has worked in my life and as I have repented and as I've seen the beauty of what God intends for all those cultures, I actually am almost on the opposite side. I, I, I enjoy talking to people of different backgrounds and different colors and different languages and and there is an incredible interest there. And, and, and I think that God has weeded out some of those roots of, of selfishness, really. It's, it's really a, a essential narcissism. I, I want people to look like me and be like me. And, and I believe that God would lead us to be repentant of that and to examine your heart and say, are there any colors in, in my heart that are, I mean, are any flavors that are wrong of how I treat people and how I look at people? And then lastly, I think that we ought to be reconcilers, that the people who are followers of Jesus should be bringing together. We should be helping people understand. And it starts with listening and empathy, and it should be a part of our prayer. Um, God that tells us to pray for our leaders. I think we should also pray for our countries and pray for, for our churches, that we would be homes where, where people feel comfortable and safe, no matter what their backgrounds are, or what their experiences or what their ethnicity is. And that that should, all the things that we see on TV and all of the disruption, that it should move us to prayer and move us to a response. And in fact, one of the coolest things I've seen in all of this is there were some people from black churches and white churches and all kinds of different groups. And they came together in the very place where George Floyd was killed. And they not only the, the prayer vigil that's going on there and some of the decorations, but they held a worship and praise service together, showing and, and, and seeing the colors blending together and to see the, the churches blending together and to see people being one people before one God. And, uh, and I think that followers of Christ should be parts of those kinds of movements and parts of those kinds of healing so however this strikes you, and, and I say this carefully because you can hardly talk about this topic without making somebody mad, but just let God work in your heart and make this a part of a spiritual process for you as you think about that there were followers of Jesus in this time that were, they were owned and uh, they had no rights and yet somehow they managed to follow Jesus in the midst of that. And so let me challenge us to be doing exactly the same thing. So what does it mean to be somebody who has a great heart for working because of Jesus in my life? And I want you to see, he goes right back to, he says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord. So if you were to be serving God in your job, if you were to be thinking of yourself as a cashier, checking Jesus out in the grocery line or, or providing a cabinet for Jesus house, or if you can see yourself as somehow bringing Jesus into your world, what kind of work would you do? And what he says is you would be working wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly, not trying to get by with as little as you can get that, that there's a reason that, that people who really love Jesus should be hard workers and we need to work hard and then we need to rest well. And both of those are true, but the work hard should be a part of our culture and part of our lifestyle. And it also means kids, if you're listening that when your mom and dad are trying to teach you how to do the chores, and let me tell you, this is important life skills. You're going to need to do laundry. You're going to need to eat. You're going to, you're going to need to learn how to work, but that's not a bad thing. That's actually something you should lean into and want to learn. And you'll find that you're also learning your attitudes about work, not just how to do the dishes, but how do you do them cheerfully? Remember last week we talked about that obedience should be in our home. We said, how do you obey cheerfully and quickly in pastor Will's home? They said, we're going to do it right away and all the way. And, and that talks about the attitudes with which we approach work. And believe me, I know it is not exciting to do some of the things that you have to do around the house. I don't know what the worst chore at your house, taking out the trash or washing the dishes, or I don't, I don't know what that thing that everybody tries to avoid is, but God wants to work in our lives so that we can even do those things as though we were doing them for him. So he goes right in and he talks about our attitudes, the why, the, the, the things that are underneath. And he goes back and he says, slaves, you should work with respect. 
that there should be an attitude of honor and respect. And so that's how we are to work, respecting those people we work with and those people we work for. And then he says with sincerity of heart, meaning not mixed and divided, but a one heart kind of a thing. In fact, in fact, he talks about wholehearted is the word that I love out of this wholehearted working is God's will. See, sometimes we think of God's will as something exciting that will reveal our destiny for the future. And who will I marry? And how many kids will I have? And what kind of a job will I end up with? And, and I think the, the will of God is a lot more daily than that. The will of God is what has he called you to do right now? And how do you do it with respect and with sincerity? And how do you do it wholeheartedly? How do you do it as though Jesus were right there? In fact, that's, I think, the idea, not that we are just serving God and feeling like we're slaves to him, but we're doing it as with this understanding of all that he's given to me and all that he's done for me. And if I could have the privilege of doing something back, if I could have the privilege of paying it forward to other people for all that I've received. And that's the attitude, he says, every day when you go to work, every, every day, kids, when you, you look at the chores that your mom or dad assigns you, he says, I want you to look at it and think about how do I do this as though Jesus were right here? How do I, how do, I do this because I love Jesus? How do I respond? And then, of course, he switches it. Oh, excuse me. And then this is the question for all of us about how do we work is what kind of work do I do? When you show up at work, what kind of reaction do you think other people have? (laughs) Do they think, oh, good. They're here. It's going to be a great day. I like working with them. They've got a good attitude. They work hard. Or is it going to be like, oh, great. Them showing up is like two good people being gone. (laughs) They're going to have a stinky attitude. I'm going to have to listen to complaining all the time. Uh, They're going to work half heartedly. So I'm going to have to work double. What, what do people feel? Just think about that for a moment. What do people feel because of the way you work? And that, I think, is an indicator of, are you getting this wholehearted thing? Are you getting this, doing it out of love for Christ? And then he switches to the other side. And he says, some of you are not only working for people. You're not only working in under authority. You are, are authorities, whether you are a small business owner or a, a boss or a supervisor or manager, whatever your position. And remember last week, we also talked about that roles are temporary. If you don't know how to be a good worker, you probably will not be a good leader. But that's the school by which you come through. And, and hopefully you learn the right attitudes and the right way to be a good leader. And so he looks at the leaders and he says, and masters treat your slaves in the same way. You think, what, what same way? And I think it goes right back up to that verse where he says, as slaves of Christ. You see, you think of yourself as I'm the master, you're the slave. No, no, no. He says, you guys are both slaves of Jesus. You're both followers of Jesus. And in fact, God doesn't see you as any different. He, there's, there's no differences in the view of God in terms of our worth or value. We just have different responsibilities. And that's why people who are followers of Jesus that go to work and threaten their employees, blame their employees, are angry, take things out, all of the ugly stuff that you hear in the ugly boss stories. Those are things that are totally wrong in terms of how I as a leader, I as a servant leader should be leading people. So that's a good question. A couple of questions for you. Am I leading as if God is here? Wouldn't it make a difference if you thought of God just standing in the corner watching you? Or if God was filling out your uh, report afterwards of how you did? So he says, I want you to have this mindset that you are not the high one, that God is the high one. And that you're first of all responsible to him. And then the second question, I think fits exactly the same with somebody who's working as an employee. Are you working wholeheartedly? I don't know why it is, but sometimes people who do a good job when they're working as the employee, when they become the boss, they think somehow now I've got the corner office, I've got the privilege, now I can slack off. And it begins to show in how much golf time they have or, or how they put things that they don't like to do on everybody else's, on everybody else's plate. And, and I think we need to understand leaders that we follow Jesus And I was thinking this story is such a powerful story in the life of Jesus in John chapter 13. And it says, 
And he knew that, all, that God the Father had placed all the things under his authority. So Jesus was not doing this because he didn't have a good self-image or didn't know where, who he was. And it says, knowing where he had come from and that he was going back to the Father. And the night before he was betrayed, Jesus took off that robe and, and he put on a towel and he got down and he did the job of the lowest slave. He washed the muddy, ugly, <laughs> chicken manure feet of the disciples. And then he got up because they were shocked. And you know, there was a lot of that story. If you want to read it in John 13. And then he said this, if I, your Lord and master have done this to you, I want you to treat each other like this with respect, with sincerity, with being willing to do the ugliest task because I am serving the King of Kings. I am serving God. It is how we are to do as leaders. And there's a wonderful little book. Uh, it's one page long in your Bible. And it is right before the book of Hebrews. And it's called Philemon. You can maybe read it this week. But it's a story of a slave named Onesimus. And his boss was named Philemon. And Philemon was a believer. And Onesimus ran away from his master. And if you read the story carefully, there's an implication that, that he probably stole some stuff and took off. And he runs into a far city where he gets thrown in jail. And guess who else is in jail? The apostle Paul. And together in jail, they share stories and Paul is able to lead him to become a follower of Jesus. And so what does he do? Does he tell him, okay, you're free in Christ. Now get out of here. No, he tells him you're responsible for what you did. I want you to go back to your master But oh, guess what? I'm going to send you a letter. And he writes a letter to Philemon. And he says to Philemon, this man was a worthless slave to you because he ran away and stole stuff. But now he's your brother in Christ. And then he says this powerful phrase. He said, I want you to receive Onesimus back, your runaway slave, like you would receive me, the apostle Paul. And he says, oh, by the way, if he owes you anything, I'll pay it but don't forget you owe me your very life. So it's that picture of Onesimus and Philemon who were both, they were in this master slave relationship that had obviously gone South. And yet he says, you're both followers of Jesus. And so the way you respond ought to be differently. So if you are somebody who has got the privilege of being a supervisor or a leader, I want you to ask yourself the question, would I want to work for me? How do I do at listening to my employees? How do I do at caring for them? How do I do at protecting them? How do I do at being clear? And it doesn't mean you don't ask people to work hard or sometimes to do hard things. It means you do it as though you are serving Jesus, that he is the high one and not you. And it doesn't mean that you allow your ego to carry you away. And as a a leader at family church, let me just tell you, uh, we would ask you to pray for us. This is a difficult season. Um, All of us are dealing with things we've never dealt with before. And as we begin the process of reopening the church as, or the church meetings, excuse me, as, as we get into the process of how do life groups work over the summer, all these things, um, even little things like we're moving communion to next week and just those small changes that come. um, There's always some reaction and it's difficult to know how to, to lead well, And I want you to know your leaders are working hard and praying carefully and trying to make the best decisions we can. And, and as we see all the tensions caused by the reactions to the COVID crisis, as we see the tensions as the reactions to the, the situation that, that has come about after the George Floyd murder. Let me just ask that as I pray that you would pray that God would work in you and that we as a church could respond in a loving, united, respectful fashion, even if we disagree about things. So let me pray for us. God, thank you for loving us <laughs> in spite of how, many, how much brokenness there is and how many blind spots we have. And God, I pray for Family Church that as we reconnect in meetings, that you would help us to again remember that our, we belong to you and, and the fact that we can get together is a privilege and that we need that. But God, more we need that personal, quiet relationship with you, that the why, how, that the why we serve has to come before the how we do it. So Father, we ask for your presence and your 
your unity and your peace on our church family and on, on each individual listening. And that, God, you would help us to be healers and reconcilers and that we would be the people that, that at our workplace and in our neighborhoods and in our homes reflect you. And that, God, you would help us where we don't and that you would change us because this is way too hard for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, out of our messages, instead of having next steps, we've been making a challenge for you to do discussions. And I was so encouraged. Somebody said to me, you know, we've been having those discussions. He said, I know people that don't even go to church that have been watching, that have been having those discussions. And, and he said, I would find I remember what we talked about far better. So let me ask you a couple lead up questions. Um, if you are somebody who is an employee, if you're a kid working at home, Right now, would you say, what's your work attitude? Scale of one to 10, are you a two or an eight, 9.7? Um, what is your attitude if you are some kind of a parent, leader, supervisor? Uh, are you doing it as a servant leader? Are you doing it with a humbleness towards Christ and as though he were right there in the building with you? And, and out of that, I want you to have this as your discussion question. What, how does God want to change me? What does he want to change about my attitudes and my responses? And I'm encouraged that you're going to have that discussion with whoever you're uh, listening with, or maybe even just a friend you want to give a phone call to. And if you're in a group, here's how you're going to decide who is going to start. Who took out the trash last? I know that's one of the jobs that people like to, to skip out on, but who took out the trash last? And I hope you have a blessed day and a wonderful discussion. God bless.